Hi, everyone. We're so sorry for running a little bit late. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty due to the fact that we're doing this between three different countries and at least two different states. So um, just bear with us while we um, while we adjust. Um, I will start with our introductions just so that we can start jumping into this um, and a few ground rules. So today um, we have prepared something a little special for everyone uh, for Ukraine's Independence Day. Happy Ukraine Independence Day. So this legal webinar will be on immigration programs for Ukrainians uh, in Poland, Germany, and the United States. Um, we'll also talk briefly about Canada. Uh, this webinar is hosted jointly by LINU, the Legal Information Network for Ukraine, as well as United for Ukraine, uh, which is an international Swiss-based NGO helping people affected by the war in Ukraine. Um, so together we will speak about the different programs, again, in different countries, eligibility, conditions of employment, lengths of stay, ability to change programs and countries. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session um, during which uh, you'll be able to ask questions. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. So the webinar will uh, feature uh, Marina Skarbek uh, from Poland. Hi, Marina. Um, it will Hello, also everyone. feature Wiebke. <laughs> um, it also uh, feature Wiebke Holtapfel uh, from Germany, Irina Brodsky from USA, and we will not have, unfortunately, Leah Jamilova joining us. Um, she is sick, so unfortunately, she could not join us today. But Irina will be answering all questions regarding um, the U.S. immigration program. Um, just a couple words about Lino. A legal, LINU, um, legal Information Network for Ukraine, of which I am very proud to be one of the co-founders, is a growing grassroots effort born out of the urgent need to provide timely and accurate U.S. immigration information to all those fleeing their homes as a result of the war in Ukraine and those unable to return because of the military actions or fear of persecution. So our immediate objective is to offer legal information to those displaced by the war. Um, we provide... Um, a lot of different resources, such as our legal library, which you can find on our website, uh, which is translated into Russian and Ukrainian. Um, and we also hold these webinars. Um, we usually do at least one Q&A session um, a month and also theme webinars such as this one on different topics. Um, United for Ukraine. Um, they came before the program Uniting for Ukraine was uh, was announced, um, although they share a very similar title, is uh, an international NGO. And at this point, it uh, they offer individual informational support, free legal advice and housing in more than 20 countries. In cooperation with Brighter Technology, UFU established a digital platform that connects individual requests with the expertise of their legal partners. UFU has a broad network of pro bono legal partners, law firms, and individual lawyers from different European countries, Marina and Wipke being two of them, um, that provide free legal aid with individual requests on a variety of topics of interest to Ukrainian refugees. So they're not just limited by um, immigration law. Um, you can contact UFU for informational support through their social media or file a request for legal aid through their website. And I will be including that in the chat um, for everyone right here. And on the and also Lino. So those are just some resources for everyone for the future. So just a couple of uh, basic rules. You will see that your cameras are turned off. You'll see that your mics are turned off. Um, that does not mean, however, that you cannot ask questions. So as long as you type into the chat, to me, the questions that you have for any one of the panelists, um, we will be able to answer them towards the end of the roundtable discussion. So just again, very, very much reminding everyone, do not type that to Vipke or Arena um, or Marina. Uh, they will not be seeing these. They will be too busy telling us about the programs that exist in their countries, but I will be monitoring my chat. So I will certainly be answering. 
So we will start with some questions for Marina. And the reason why we're doing this this way is because of the sort of natural path. Uh, many of the uh, people that were fleeing the war um, in February and in the um, and the months that followed in 2022 went through Poland. So Poland was really the first country to accept a lot of the fleeing Ukrainians. So Marina, I'm going to start asking you some questions if you're ready. Sure, go okay. on. So Marina, if you can just give us a general introduction to the eligibility criteria for temporary protection for Ukrainian citizens and their family members in Poland. Uh, so basically, the Polish progress state program is uh, quite wide, I'd say. So uh, you don't have uh, specific eligibility criteria. You just have to uh, be a Ukrainian citizen or living in living in Ukraine now. Uh, at the moment of uh, uh, January 2022, or uh, if you're a citizen of different country, you have to be a spouse of a Ukrainian citizen, and then you're eligible for the temporary protection status, and uh, uh, basically you have all the rights uh, under it. And you have to come to Poland uh, in connection with uh, the war go actions going on in Ukraine, so you have to state it directly on the border or when you come to register for temporary protection. So this is also an important condition because there are also many people coming to Poland, not for temporary protection, just coming to visit family or as tourists or just to spend time here or to go through. So basically, it's you have to be Ukrainian citizen or a spouse of Ukrainian citizen living in Ukraine at the break of the war. And uh, you have to wish to receive temporary protection in Poland and to state so in writing when you apply for this temporary protection. That's it. Sorry about that. I muted myself. So <laughs> once somebody arrives in Poland from Ukraine, how much time do they have to submit the application for temporary protection after they arrive? There's also no time limit. So basically, at, at any point, you are only limited by the fact that if you do not come and uh, submit um, this application for temporary protection, you have to be mindful for uh, your um, visa-free stay. So it's based on this um, no visa movement uh, um, with EU. So you have to be careful not to... Uh, cross um, the limit of 90 days within 180 days. So this is the only thing uh, that uh, that somehow, but uh, uh, at any point from the crossing of the border, you have to, uh, you have the possibility to apply for temporary protection and it doesn't have to be your first entrance into Poland. However, what is important that the Polish uh, kind of support program um, paying money to those who uh, host refugees and uh, uh, provide them housing, food and different support only lasts for each um, person coming into Poland for 120 days from the first crossing of the border. So this may be, if you want to use this program, which is called 40 plus, this has to be done immediately. So if you don't want to use it, you can apply for temporary protection at any pretty much any point of your legal stay in Poland. And is this program still available to people who are still in Ukraine now who are debating whether to leave? Yes, it okay. has been continued until uh, 4th March 2024, okay. recently. And for I some, I haven't mentioned it, um, apologies, for some categories of people like uh, pregnant women or women with small children or disabled people, uh, the program is extended further than 120 days. But for most people, it's 120 days. So it's important to keep in mind. So what happens after those 120 days? What are the options of uh, legal stay, legalization in Poland for those Ukrainians um, who want to stay after, after that period of time? Uh, so basically, the only thing that changes, because you already have this temporary protection uh, before you apply for this program, and this program is only uh, monetary support for those offering uh, support to refugees. So it somehow compensates them for their efforts. So it's not directly paid to the refugees them themselves. 
Uh, after those 120 days, uh, what is important, you can stay in Poland until, um, well, for now, 4th March, but it has been gradually extended uh, each year. So I presume that it will last uh, till the end uh, of uh, the war. Uh, you can also work. You can use all medical facilities, schools, uh, and social support that is available to Polish citizens. What about uh, the options for those Ukrainians who are not eligible for temporary protection? So who would those be? I think mostly those are people who um, did not live in Ukraine at the moment, for example, lived in Poland and whose visa expired or uh, temporary residence permit expired. And uh, uh, or, for example, they were under obligation, uh, legal obligation to return. Uh, to Ukraine. So for those categories, their, the legality of their stay has been extended until the same day. So for, for now, it's 4th March 2024. They are not under temporary protection. And here is the difference. It is important. But they can legally stay. So this is, uh, um, they do not have the, the validity of their permits or visas just has been extended for the time. Um, can, I, I think you touched upon this, but just to kind of reiterate this part. So can Ukrainians who are, um, who are staying in, uh, Poland under the visa free regime, can they work? Yes. Yes. They do not have to obtain a job permit. They under temporary protection, they have full access, uh, to, uh, work and to the job markets. And a lot of Ukrainians work in Poland. So, uh, it is, uh. It is happening. It is not uh, um, not in any way limited for them. Great. Um, one issue that we've definitely been seeing in the United States, and I'm sure you know, we'll touch upon that uh, when we get to the U.S., but um, is about minors. Um, can minors um, 16 to 18 years old, can they come to Poland alone if they have relatives in Poland? Uh, yes. But just to be 100% sure, because uh, one thing is that legally they can, and the other thing is situation on the border, when you not always uh, have 100% uh, uh, knowledgeable uh, border guards. So to for, for whole comfort, to be absolutely sure, the best way is uh, to have a consent of uh, one parent, uh, for somebody accompanying them or just for them to live alone. And for uh, the best case uh, scenario is if it's not raised, if it's not possible, at least have it in writing because it would go a long way just for also border guards to be sure that this is a legit crossing, that somebody is waiting for them to have this contact to be able to somehow verify it if it's not a situation that is dangerous to the minor because... Uh, it can it can also raise some suspicion on their side. And it's important that in Poland, the minor will also have uh, to go through the procedure of registering um, with some family member who will be acting in his interest afterwards. So it's it's uh, worse to think it through and uh, get as many notarized consents and documents uh, before uh, as possible. And I think we will definitely touch upon this later because it's it's not it's not always an option for um for I think all all programs but that's that's great to know um you mentioned the support that is available for Ukrainians in Poland um is there any support with housing and um is there any ability for Ukrainians to apply for social housing Housing is the most complicated issue, I'd say, that uh, we actually see here in Poland uh, due to a big number of people coming. So this uh, 40 plus program is really helpful in a way that uh, people and hotels just uh, take people eligible for this program. So they live for free and their hotels or owners of uh, uh, some bed and breakfast just receive compensation from the state for that. So there are also um, big centers, but they are not in any way conditions to live long term. There are still families also taking in uh, people for free, uh, which is, uh, again, um, probably limited now to smaller towns uh, and uh, not big cities. Uh, 
Uh, social housing is uh, difficult in a way that, yes, Ukrainians can apply for that, but the queues, the lines to wait for social housing, it's in years, counted in years also for Polish citizens. So it's just very limited amount of uh, housing available um, and it's a big problem in Poland. So um, it is not uh, all solved in any different way for Ukrainians. I'm nodding my head because it seems like housing is a problem everywhere. You everywhere. To this point, yes. Um, so what are the prospects of extension of, of temporary protection in Poland beyond the 4th of March of 2024? And what might be the options for legalization in Poland after this temporary protection is lifted? So in other words, for people who uh, enjoy living in Poland, who want to stay and don't want to go back, what are their options of staying in Poland legally? Uh, so as for extension of uh, this temporary protection, uh, well, it's uh, beyond my sphere of influence. But if I have to uh, comment my opinion, I am absolutely sure that it will um, last as long as the war lasts. So I, I don't see it ending uh, on uh, any earlier date because it has been extended uh, several times already. Uh, as for legalization, already uh, now uh, those who um, feel that uh, they they want to live and work in Poland, they can apply for a temporary residence permit. And after temporary residence permit, uh, you can apply for permanent residence, citizenship, and so on. So this is the standard route. So already now, um, those who are currently staying under temporary protection can uh, kind of switch their status to this temporary residence permit, which counts then to towards years uh, that you need for the permanent residence and permit and for uh, becoming a citizen. So um, what about uh, the possibility to receive temporary protection in Poland after a person has had such temporary protection in another EU country? So for example, if they left and went to, let's say, Romania, and now they want to come to Poland. What about those Ukrainians? It was possible before, but that changed uh, since January, and now it's not possible uh, for if uh, any person had uh, temporary protection in another EU country, then uh, this person cannot uh, um, apply for it in Poland. However, if it was a non-EU state, then it's still possible because of the wording of the provision. I do not know if it will be possible in the future, they will not change it, but for now, this is how uh, this is how it sounds. So uh, just, uh, just EU states are excluded. So in other words, if somebody holds a Canadian quit visa or a US parole, you know, such as you for you, they would be capable of still coming into Poland and receiving temporary protection. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, how does one correctly cancel temporary protection in Poland if a person wants to move to another EU country or back to Ukraine? Uh, you just have to go to um, an office um, where you received the temporary, applied for temporary protection. So the, the same type of office, it doesn't have to be the exact office in the same city. Uh, and uh, you fill in like one page document um, with a statement that you want to resign it. And then basically that's it. So it's a very not complicated uh, procedure. Um, and I guess the last question uh, for you, and you know, it's, it's always fascinating for us in the US just because of the, uh, everything is so close in Europe and everyone is going from country to country the way that we go from state to state. Um, but is it possible at this point to transit through the territory of Poland uh, without a valid biometric passport for Ukrainians who are returning back to Ukraine from other countries? So in other words, somebody who, let's say, is right now living in Germany or, you know, in, um, you know, in, in, in any other country where they would need to go through Poland in order to get back into Ukraine. What do they need for that? Uh 
it's uh, actually the one of the difficult questions because uh, uh, it's on case by case basis. Um, I have personally spoken uh, to uh, several uh, border guards who uh, gave me completely different information on that and on particular cases. Uh, so what I would advise uh, uh, first thing is you can apply for a passport in Poland and receive it. Uh, Ukrainian mm, normal passport. So uh, the best way, I don't know if you can do it in other countries, but uh, it's definitely possible in Poland. So it's the easiest way to just apply for it and then go without any problems. But uh, if not, then just have uh, uh, all the documents uh, um, available. So the temporary protection from the other country. So the all the uh, documents on the basis on which uh, uh, you entered, because I have seen cases where everything went smoothly on the board control and uh, people without passwords were allowed on without any problems and then also allowed to re-enter. But I've also seen cases that um, demanded intervention and uh, were a lot, of, uh, a lot of stress. So if it's possible, just make a passport. If it's not possible, just have all your documents with you and printed, written out so you can support um, the evidence that uh, you came without it when it was possible and uh, now you're coming back um, the same way. That's uh, it, definitely something that I'm hearing as well from uh, from the U.S. folks is that so much of it depends on who you're, who is going to be welcoming you into the country. Unfortunately, uh, yes. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Marina. Really, uh, really appreciate this. So kind of moving along um, in our European travel, so to speak, we're now going to go to Germany with uh, Vipke. And uh, I will ask you some questions as well. And again, thank you so much, uh, Marina, for, um, for that. You. If anyone has questions specifically on the Polish program or anything having to do with um, transiting through Poland, you can please type the questions to me and I will ask them of Marina towards the end, okay? Um, so now for Vipke, first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you can just give us the general introduction to the eligibility criteria for temporary protection for Ukrainians and their family members in Germany. Yeah. In Germany, that's very similar to Poland. And the reason is it's both EU countries and all this is based on a directive. So you are eligible to um, enter Germany without a visa, just on the basis of your biometric ID or passport. If you are a Ukrainian national with your residence in Ukraine before February 24th, 2022, and family members, that spouses, unmarried partners, minor, minor unmarried children, and close relatives who are dependent, say for health reasons, who are living in the same household, irrespective of their citizenship. And then, so this is the, the large group of refugees, I believe. And then there are a few other ones, stateless persons and uh, nationals of third countries other than Ukraine with a protected legal status in Ukraine. And in particular, if they cannot safely return to their country of origin. But there it's sort of the nitty nitty fine print and you have to look very specifically if you are not a Ukrainian national. But there is a large group like really basically any Ukrainian national who lived in Ukraine when the war broke out can come to Germany and apply for temporary protection. So it's, it's very interesting. Just to clarify on that, um, so if, for example, a Ukrainian citizen is married to somebody who is who was, a, let's say, even a Russian citizen, um, they can still both come um, as a couple to Germany under this uh, the German program. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. My understanding, and uh, Irina can, can certainly speak more to that, we just had a long webinar yesterday on uh, the temporary protected status in the United States, which was just extended, is that it they uh, everyone has to be Ukrainian citizen in order to qualify for that. So that's definitely something that, or maybe I'm wrong. So uh, maybe it's I'm wrong. certainly easier if you have a Ukrainian passport to sort of get all the boxes checked right away. Um, <laughs> All right, so that's uh, that's great for the mixed families. Um, and how much time does one have to submit the application 
for the temporary protection after arriving in Germany? Well, um, when you have a biometric passport, uh, you can stay and move freely within the European Union for 90 days. And if you stay longer, you need either a residence permit or some visa or any sort of official document that allows you to stay in Germany for more than 90 days. Otherwise, your stay is illegal. So this is essentially the same time frame as in Poland. And uh, in Germany, what you need is called a residence permit. Um, it requires a couple of steps to obtain a residence permit. But here, since Ukrainian refugees enjoy uh, temporary protection, um, it's, it's a standardized procedure. They have to go through these steps and I can briefly take you through them. It sounds, it may sound a bit complicated at the beginning, but um, other people have completed the procedure successfully. And I think that it, it's feasible. Uh, you just have to do it. So step one is an initial re registration. Uh, you need to be registered in order to obtain temporary protection and also to receive state benefits. There are reception centers all over the country um, at train stations. And if there is none, you can always register with a local police station. Um, probably a reception center is easier in terms of language and people do it all day long. Uh, whereas a random police station at the countryside may not be so familiar with the process, but it works everywhere. So if you come to Germany and you do not have family or friends where you can stay and who will accommodate you for a longer period of time, you somehow need state housing and accommodation. And so initial registration is one of the very first thing to do upon arrival, um, because there you will be told where you will initially live and uh, you will be provided with what you need to accommodate you. If you can stay with family or friends and if you do not immediately meet state benefits, you also need to register, um, but only your personal details will be recorded and um, you can stay basically where you want and you will not be obviously assigned a place to live. And step two, you need to register with a local registration office at the place of your destination. When, when you've been assigned a place where to live, like sort of collective housing or whatever it may be in the interim, you need to register with a local registration office as basically it's telling them where you live. It's something Germans have to do too. So it's a very formal procedure, but you have to complete it. And then step three, that's the application for a residence permit. Oftentimes you just check an additional box, but you need to be sure to check the box because you need to apply for it. It will not be issued automatically. Um, you typically um, apply where, where you are at, at your residence or where you have been assigned to, to stay for the time being. And so now why is this residence permit so important? It's only then you have the protected status and can lawfully stay in Germany beyond the 90 day limit. You need a residence permit to receive financial assistance. You need a residence permit to uh, obtain um, integration services such as language courses. And, and I think that's most important, you need a residence permit to have access to the job market. Because as in Poland, you can work here, um, but you need a residence permit. And there, there may be a time gap between your application and the issuance of the permit. And in during this time, you'll get some provisional document. And that also grants you access to a German job market, um, save for some professional restrictions where you when you exercise a profession where you need a license, like a doctor or so, but, but if you have a profession that's not uh, subject to any special license, you can work here. And um, so this is essentially the process. Many people have completed it. Um, anyone who wants to complete it can't complete it.
Thank you so much. That's very thorough um, and definitely very, very helpful. Um, another question that I had for you was uh, Germany, uh, as far as um, as far as I know, is divided into federal states, federal lands, right? So how does the allocation of refugees between the German federal lands work? And how does one check whether a federal state currently accepts Ukrainian refugees? So for example, um, like Bavaria versus Brandenburg, right? Um, which obviously is a, is a huge difference for people um, in how they travel and plan their lives. So if you can talk a little bit to that. Well, this is only in the scenario where you need state housing and the like. If you have family and friends, you can, you will live where they are and you don't have to justify your decision because it is what it is. Um, but if you need um, collect, uh, state, state help, uh, state accommodation, um, the system is that as a refugee, you do not have a right to choose the state to live in. This is because it's a federal state. And the idea here is that the burden of uh, caring for all the refugees should be distributed evenly among the states. And so there's a system of fixed quotas for every state as to how many refugees they accommodate. And... Um, then obviously family ties and the like will be taken into your account. So if you are have been assigned a city in Bavaria, your spouse will not be sent to Lower Saxony. This is this will not happen. And um, so um, I, I'm not aware of an official government site or, or anything that informs you about the states that still have uh, capacity to, to take on refugees. I, I found an internet blog um, at visitukraine.today, uh, pursuant to which some states still have capacity because as in Poland, housing is, uh, is an issue in Germany too. And we're just at the moving towards the limits of our resources. So according to that side, but really no guarantee, it's Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, so in the South, has, which is somewhere in the middle, Saxony, Thuringia, and Saarland. Um, I know that there, there are other places that may be more popular, and I think the most popular place is Berlin. Um, but that's exactly the reason why you may not choose as a refugee where to live, because then everybody would end up in Berlin, and that's just too much for one place to. Of course, I think we all heard about re reports of trains coming in every hour into uh, into Berlin uh, in the beginning of the war. So I'm sure that at this point that's that that has greatly affected its capacity. Um, and on which grounds can a person choose which federal state or city to register in? I think you just said that they can they cannot do that. Um, if you can just explain that. And what is the procedure to change the residence? Uh, to another federal state. So, you know, again, in general terms, so if somebody um, is uh, receiving government benefits and they're, let's say, in Saxony, but now they uh, want to move to uh, Bavaria. So what? how would they go about that? How, would, how does that work? Well, let me just clarify. If you do not need state benefits, you can essentially go where you want. So if you happen to be rich or if you have a job, Maybe you can you still have your job in Ukraine and you can work remotely and you will earn enough to, to cover your living expenses. Uh, you can choose your place. Same if, if someone else provides for you. Um, so that, that is sort of the easy way to choose where to live. If you are in state assistance, essentially under the Residence Act, you, you cannot choose. Um, but um, if you want to change, um, grounds for changing are typically job related or anything that would get you into a job. So if you are in, in a village in Bavaria and now you've got, um, you, you can study in say Cologne, you've been admitted to university, uh, you can, that, that's grounds for obtaining, for applying and then obtaining a permit, a permission to, to move uh, to Cologne. Same, anything of vocational training. So anything that is like job related or that will qualify you are valid grounds to um, obtain permission. And uh, again, family ties are respected. So if one member of the family, if, if 
if you if a husband can can move to has a job in Cologne, obviously the wife can come with him. Uh, same with minor children. And um, as to the way how to do it, you need an approval from the authorities of the state where you're located. Typically, they will liaise with the state where you want to go and um, work this out with the authorities first. Obtain your approval first, then move. Do not reverse the order. Um, you you risk losing, if you are on financial assistance and receive state benefits, there's a risk of, of losing them and you just don't want that. Speaking of minors, uh, same question to you as uh, for Marina. So can minors, um, the 16 to 18 crowd, uh, come to Germany alone if they have relatives in Germany? Yes, they can. Okay. Uh, we do not have the border issue to the same extent as Poland has, um, because they are already in Europe typically when, when they come to Germany. But yes, they can come. Um, they can come alone. And they should contact the next youth welfare office to ensure that their needs are taken care of. And so, uh, you know, Germany generally tends to um, be pretty famous for its social support system, which is why I think a lot of Ukrainians, when the war started, fled to Germany. Um, can you give us somewhat of a general introduction to what that German social support system is, um, the financial help um, and health insurance, if you could speak to that, that'd be really, really helpful. Yeah, Germany has decided to grant Ukrainian refugees sort of preferential uh, social support. They are not treated like asylum seekers. So it's a huge difference between a war refugee from Ukraine and a refugee from, say, the war in Syria. It's a huge difference. And um, so, so here everything turns... Uh, again, around the residence permit, which gives you access to the job market. Um, but if you cannot, if you're just not able to, you don't find a job, you can't really work right now. You don't speak German, whatever. You need state benefits. Uh, what can you get? It's called Bürgergeld. Uh, it's something like citizen's income. And uh, this includes uh, benefits to secure your daily expenses. Uh, housing, uh, so accommodation, heating, benefits for integration into work, so vocational training, and then of course language classes, anything to, to sort of help you to find a job in Germany. And then in addition, there are some one-off benefits like initial furniture for your accommodation or for children, special tutoring classes, uh, that, that's really sort of on a case by case basis. The benefits are provided in cash. Vouchers are an option, but cash is sort of the general rule. And then uh, in addition, uh, a recipient of this citizen's income is covered by the statutory health insurance. And the, the burger guilt that you that you mentioned, um, the the, the financial, the, the monetary cash assistance. Uh, what obligations do people who receive it have? So is it something that goes on indefinitely or there are some rules about getting it? There are some rules about it. You, you must, when, when you apply for it, you must provide correct information. You must provide complete information. You have to, and sometimes prove the information. You must um, inform the authorities if something changes that would affect the amount of the allowance or that prevents you from receiving it. So for instance, your rent has been increased. Um, you get married, you found a job. This is something you have to report immediately and you must be available. Um, the authorities are, that are managing the system are called job centers and um, they expect you to be available to contact you at, well, more or less all times. The idea is that they might refer a job opportunity. And so this is why they need to somehow call you, text you, whatever. So if you travel, um, if you even if you move or if you're moving to another place within the same town, 
you go to a hospital, uh, you, you must inform the job center in advance. Now for a hospital that may not always work, but for, for all other things, when you travel, when you're somehow not where you're expected to be found, inform the job center, inform them in advance. And as a general rule, they must agree. So you must get permission to, to leave the place where you are. And um, since the system is designed for Germans, it's you can only be away for three weeks a year. So if you return to Ukraine to, to visit someone, and this takes more time, it's essential to work it out with the job center in advance, uh, because otherwise you risk, risk uh, losing your benefits. I'm sure there are ways to, to work this out, but just do it in advance. Do not just leave and then come back and see the, the mess that you're in. And, and if you have appointments with the job center, again, um, you must attend them. The idea is that you must do everything you can to find a job. So you should apply for jobs and when they refer a job opportunity, um, you, you should accept it um, if it's a reasonable job offer. Um, in reasonable in light of your qualification and overall situation. Um, so uh, if, and if you do turn down a job offer, your benefits may be reduced. So okay. this can happen. Um, it, for, for a refugee who does not speak German, I, I don't think such a refugee will be swamped with job offers in the very first month. But uh, I, I've heard cases where uh, a job offer was turned down um, and uh, the reaction was uh, prompt. Uh, they cut the benefits or, or reduced them. And this is just a risk you do not want to run. So the expectation is, of course, that this is just uh, to help you get on your feet. Um, and eventually, if you want to stay to to start working. Um, and my next question to you is the same question that I asked of Marina also. So um, my understanding is that uh, the temporary protection in Germany is also until March 4th, 2024. Right. Is that right? Okay. So what are the options for the people who have settled in, in Germany in this time and who would really like to stay in Germany? How can they legally do that? Um, if and when the temporary protection is lifted on March twenty, uh, March 4th of 2024? Well, I assume German authorities or, or European authorities to, to extend temporary protection for as much time as needed. But once it's lifted, uh, if someone wants to, to stay here, um, you need to apply for a permanent uh, residence permit or some other way to to obtain a valid title to stay in this country. Typically that's a permanent resident uh, permit or even citizenship. Uh, this is, there it's not enough to be a Ukrainian refugee. Um, you, this is granted on an individual case by case basis. And a uh, key criterion is uh, your integration into this country. So language is key. Uh, the better your German, the better your prospects. If you have a job and can uh, live on your own, that will increase your chances. So, and, and often language and job go hand in hand. So anything that, that will help you to really settle in German will help you to then get uh, a, re a permanent resident uh, permit. Just yesterday, uh, there was um, the government decided to change the law on German citizenship for obtaining it. I mean, citizenship is not the same as a permanent residence permit, but um, the idea was also that it will be easier if you have a job here. So if you're financially independent um, and a good taxpayer, uh, then it will be easier to stay here. There, there will be, of course, uh, other ways. If you say you've been here for, for a very, very long time, uh, there will be probably some exceptions, some, some leniency rules, something like that. But that's highly fact specific. And so sort of what, what I can recommend, if, if you're really settled here, learn the language, get a job. I think that's sort of the, 
the best way. And understood. And this is discretionary. So there's no eligibility requirements per se. Once you've been here, you can apply for permanent residency. And then it's a matter of them reviewing your application and seeing how um, how much they want you to stay as a permanent resident, if, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, right? Yeah. I mean, there, there, there are criteria. So, so it's um, the discretion is not total. Uh, you're <laughs> Um, but uh, it, it is not like like here temporary protection where you're, you're part of a group, right? So everything is reviewed and individually in the end. Yeah. Um, and uh, a question for you, similar to again Marina's, and this is my last question for you. We've good. Thank you so much. Is it possible to uh, receive temporary protection in Germany after you have had temporary protection in another EU country? Um, so again, like let's say you received it in Poland, but now you want to move to Germany for better opportunities. Can you get that status in Germany now? Well, that appears to be possible, um, but I'm not really familiar with the details. And I also heard, uh, like like Maruna, that there are changes. Uh, I, it is if you've been in another EU country that. Uh, that may be more difficult than, as Marina said, if you've been a, in a non-EU country, that should work. Right. So similar. No, no, I'm not familiar with the US or Canada because that's just the new kid on the block. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And speaking of US or Canada, um, so uh, thank you so much, Vipka. We really appreciate it. And uh, if we will move on to across the pond to the United States and Canada, um, Irina, if you could speak briefly about uh, the what the United States has done um, and the program in the United States, and then if perhaps we have a little bit of time in the end, we can talk about Canada as well. And I'm just reminding everyone that if you have questions for um, any of, uh, of the panelists, please feel free to type them in to me in a chat. Oh, gladly. First, Happy Independence Day, everyone who is listening to me. Uh, when we are talking about the program in the United States, I cannot emphasize this enough. It is very different from what we have in Europe. We were, of course, to a certain extent, copycatting their directive, but we did not fully take it on the way it was written. So what currently happens in the United States is there are two programs that are quite independent of each other. One is United for Ukraine, Uniting for Ukrainians, U for U going forward, in order to not confuse with this thing organization that is part of the seminar today. So U for U. And the other one is the TPS, and they have not much in common. They are two different things. So what to know about it is this. U for U is a way to get into the United States if you're abroad. This program was, it started some time ago. It is currently still working. It has not been closed, nor will it be in the foreseeable future. When I get asked about, is it gonna be extended? Is it gonna be continued? My normal answer is pray that it is not because that would mean that the war is over. For the foreseeable future, you for you stays with us and so does TPS. Now TPS in the United States is part of the law. It has been for various countries for various reasons. The main reason a country can get on the TPS list is if the conditions of that country are so bad that people cannot safely stay there. We have many countries that are eligible for TPS and Ukraine got on that list. What that means is Ukrainian citizens who stayed here initially before April 2022 in any status that is important. They could have been illegal, completely illegal, crossed the border, crawled across the border, took the boat from Cuba, whatever the case might have been. They were eligible to change whatever they had for status at the time or no status whatsoever for TPS, temporary protected status. That means they could stay and work in the United States. Unfortunately, the application is not free. You have to pay for this application, but once you get it, you're here legally. That TPS can only be valid for 18 months because such is the law. However, like on month 17 of the program, normally the government issues an initiative saying the TPS for that country had been just extended for another 18 months. Salvadorians had been having theirs since 2002. 
So Ukrainians just got theirs extended. So whoever was in the United States, however they entered on you for you entering here or having had TPS from before or having had a visa and just remained in here, the TPS had been just announced as an extension. They are eligible to get a TPS by filing an online form to that effect. We will get to that later. So you for you is a program that allows people to travel in the United States. Main difference with the European programs is this. Whoever was listening carefully to what Marina and Vipka were saying today, you heard them talking about a Ukrainian citizen can whatever. U.S. program is centered on a U.S. sponsor. A traveler is a beneficiary. So in order to travel here on a U for U, you need a U.S. sponsor, which means someone who has a status here. It is not necessarily a U.S. citizen. It can be a green card holder. It can be a person on a valid visa. It can be even a person on a some sort of a continuous status, including TPS themselves. However, people without status cannot be sponsored. That is important. A person who does not have an answer to the question of what my status in the United States is cannot sponsor a Ukrainian traveler. So status. Second, finance. Your sponsor needs to be able to finance a traveler. What that means is they need to, when they fill out an application for becoming a sponsor, they attach proof that they have something, a house they live in and they have a room for the Ukrainian traveler, tax return. Uh, bank account, whatever they have to prove that they have money, which leads us to the next question. What do we do if the sponsor doesn't have enough and who decides what is enough? Who decides? That is the government. Once we get to how the application is filled out, I'm going to cover that. Um, what is enough? We have a thing called I-864P schedule, which means the federal poverty line. So the person who is sponsoring a traveler needs to be above that poverty line plus one person or two people if they're sponsoring two or four. They can sponsor as many people as they wish if they have money. However, what you're allowed to do is you can have one primary sponsor and several sponsors who are added to the primary application and supporting that sponsor. In the initial, when this was just kicked off, we had a bunch of applications that look like I am a sponsor, I have a room in my house, but I don't make any money. However, the local church, a second sponsor, is gonna feed them. And there is the third sponsor who doesn't have means to provide them with the residency. However, they promise to give the traveler $300 a month for food and clothing. And there is another sponsor who will not contribute in any way monetarily, but they promise to take um, our incoming traveler through all kinds of job applications that are required in order to get a work. So you can bundle many sponsors in there, like one main sponsor and several others. All of them together need to pass the test and the US government needs to approve that thing. Now, who can be a beneficiary, right? So once there is a sponsor, so someone who has a right to sponsor and has enough money to do so, even if coupled with a group, who can be a beneficiary? A citizen of Ukraine, a spouse of a citizen of Ukraine of any origin, similar to Poland, similar to Germany. If a Ukrainian citizen is married to a citizen of something else, they can both travel. Children, important notice, under 21, because here in the US, the child becomes adult at 21, not at 18. So kids can travel, who cannot travel all the relatives, parts of the household, elderly aunt, elderly granny, unless they have an independent right, as a Ukrainian citizen, for instance, to travel here on you for you, they cannot be part of the household. Um, another important, so that's consideration number one. Consideration number two, that person who is traveling must have resided in Ukraine before February 11, 2022. If the person had moved out of the country temporarily to say Poland or Germany or elsewhere because they were fleeing and now they want to go further to the United States, that's fine. However, the primary residence needed to have been there. If a person moved to Poland, let's say in 2019, because they liked it there and they stayed there, but all of a sudden in 2023, they decided to move to the United States, that person is not eligible for you for you because the second thing doesn't work for them. I must say, unfortunately, people will need a valid foreign passport to travel. 
it is not quite impossible to move a person without, but it is an insane hassle. And I recommend everyone who is still considering a U for you to apply wherever you currently are for a foreign passport is going to make your life so much easier. Um, next question, or do you want me to keep going? No, I'll I'll go on to the next question. I think that, that that'll be helpful. We're getting a couple of questions in the audience. I just wanted to let you know that we will hold off until um, Irina is finished, unless it's something that really fits in nicely into her narrative at this point. Um, but please stay stay tuned and we'll definitely get to you. Uh, what does the actual you for you application consist of? Fair question. So basically the sponsor needs to make themselves an online account on the certain governmental website and fill out a form called I-134. That form is very boring but very simple. It has a lot of information about the sponsor. Who are you? Where do you live? Where do you work? Stuff like that. Questions are very easy. It, a lot of them have the option of other. If they don't give you the option uh, from the drop down menu, you can choose other and write down whatever you need to write. For instance, are you related to the beneficiary in any way? Yes, he's a member of my family, drop down list or other, a friend, someone. Um, they ask basically, among other things, how many people are in the sponsor's household. Because that factors in when they try to evaluate the financial part. They will ask questions like, do you have an independent income from an illegal source? People freak out when they read that part because sure. That gets subtracted from the income. If somebody is honestly telling them, well, yeah, I deal drugs on the side and I get about 30,000 a year from that gig, that will be subtracted from the other 60 that they just declared. So um, I doubt anyone ever said yes to this question, but well, uh, they always ask whether the sponsor themselves is receiving any kind of state support for the same logic. If the sponsor is getting the state support, small surprise that as a result, the sponsor is not allowed to sponsor anyone. Um, however, state support is not a bar to sponsoring someone. If you have, for instance, a joint sponsor taking someone in. Uh, the application, I would say generally, the application needs to make sense. The sponsor needs to explain the plan for the travel. Like, how are you going to help them? What are you going to do? Um, they don't take your word for whatever you're saying on the application. You need to upload evidence. Uh, there is plenty. Of, they don't have an ex exclusive list. They just say convince us. A tax return is a great thing. Uploading tax return, remember to also upload the W-2 or 1099 or whatever form comes with it to prove income that you're actually receiving it. Letter from the employer saying we indeed employ such and such person. This is their salary. It works. Um, bank account works. Proof of immigration status must be uploaded, a birth certificate of the U.S., passport, green card, visa if you're on a visa, whatever. Um, they specifically ask what property you own that can be sold and made into money during the 12 months. It's a really weird question, but what they're trying to assess is tangible assets. So, like I said, the form sometimes looks really strange, but no, none of the questions are of such nature that the sponsor would not know what to say about. Um, once the sponsor uh, basically filled out the form, they will ask the sponsor if they agree to be vetted, which means uh, if the sponsor is a known criminal offender, it is possible that they will be denied. Mostly that goes for people who are registered in the sex offenders registry. They will not likely be able to become sponsors because they're trying to uh, screen these applications and protect the refugees. They don't want a bad sponsor to bring an unknown person into the country and then have their way with them. So that's the first part. Part number two, once the, applica the applica application can be denied, and if it is denied, then the sponsor can apply again. There is no limit on the amounts of applications. See what went wrong, maybe do better next time. Costs money. So that's going to the kick off. However, um, once the I-134 has been approved, 
One very important thing that both the sponsor and beneficiary need to remember is do not mess up your email for heaven's sake, because they use the email to notify the sponsor of the approval, but most importantly, to open an account for beneficiary. This is how the beneficiary will be informed that they are allowed to travel, and this is where they will receive their travel document that they will show at the border. So the sponsor needs to absolutely know what the beneficiary's email is and type it in correctly. Um, the beneficiary will receive an email saying, click this link and you will end up in your personal account. Once the beneficiary gets into that account, they please check the spam folder if your sponsor's application has been approved because things happen. The reason this is important is because it is time sensitive. Once the beneficiary received uh, the permission to go into the account, they will also see a questionnaire, not too complicated, not as extensive as the sponsor, but they will be asked questions about their criminal past, for instance, about their status, what is their current address. If you are outside Ukraine, it's okay to indicate your current address. If you are in Ukraine, indicate, the, uh, say, the Ukrainian address, whatever. Um, the beneficiary will be asked if they have all the necessary vaccinations. Answer truthfully, yes or no. Necessary vaccinations can be obtained here. Uh, it is not a bar. And then finally, the beneficiary, having responded to that and hit submit, will receive a pre-travel approval notification, which is a paper that needs to be printed out and shown along with the passport at the border. Last, if you forget everything I said and remember one thing, that thing should be correct email and correct spelling of the name exactly as it is in the passport, because the beneficiary that cannot be identified at the border, border will not be allowed into the United States. Following that, the beneficiary can board any plane that works for them, uh, travel to the United States, show this thing to the border guard, get a welcome to the United States, come in, meet their sponsor, go on their way, U.S. does not check where you live. They don't care what happens to you once you arrive. This, um, what happens at the border actually is the border guard is likely gonna stamp the beneficiary's passport, or if not, uh, this information can be obtained later from the web by going onto the I-94 online and getting the status there. Uh, the beneficiary will be allowed as a humanitarian parolee. The reason this is important is because people who are thus allowed are allowed to work incident to status. You do not have to apply for a separate work permit, with, which costs money. You just come in, start working immediately. Uh, they get a thing, a very important thing called social security number, which is like a personal number that is allowed for filing taxes, opening bank accounts, and all stuff like that. And together with this uh, entry stamp or a printout from the web indicating the same thing and the social security number, they can apply to any job. They can move wherever in the United States they want. Even if the sponsor said they will house them, they can totally live wherever they please. Just try to not get into trouble. Because any kind of criminal record doesn't have to but might lead to deportation. I um, included a link for everyone, um, and I will just, you know, premise this by saying that it is uh, it is old, this, or at least in the context that we're talking about, so it's over a year old. But we did record how to fill out Uniting um, for Ukraine, um, so it's called uh, How to You for You. And generally, from what I hear from the immigration attorneys, it has stayed mostly the same, the form. So, and it just goes through it. Um, because it is a rather tedious and long form. So uh, for anyone who wants to fill it out, um, that is somewhat of a tutorial to um, to be able to do that. Um, you already answered the question of who can be a sponsor and who can be um, a beneficiary. So thank you mm -hmm. for that. Um, but I wanted to ask you, can Ukrainian citizens uh, apply for parole at the Mexican or Canadian border? We hear about that a lot people going through Mexico, people going through Canada. Is that still something that's available for Ukrainians? No, that is over. That was over when they turned on this U4U you program. People previously, in the just at the inception of the war, people were able to go through Mexico, Canada, through any land border to just kind of cross and get this humanitarian parole at the border in the passport. That stopped 
two days after you for you was turned on. So do not try to travel to Tijuana and cross the border. People can cross the border requesting asylum, but the person who is eligible for you for you should not do so because uh, asylum is a totally separate kind of forms, which I will not open on this call, but these people basically end up immediately in deportation. You do not want this for yourself. Uh, People who totally lack a U.S. sponsor can contact, uh, I think Luba will talk more about it, uh, certain places that do matches. And so you don't necessarily need to be related to, to a sponsor in order to be sponsored to the United States. So unfortunately, borders are not an option anymore. Um, what about, uh, there's been a lot of um, conversation about the fact that the work permits in the United States have taken uh, take a very, very long time to receive. So once u for u was started, somebody who enters on u for u can they actually work as soon as they come in? Exactly. They can work. Uh, basically incident to status it is called which means once they have crossed the border and they have the stamp and the passport or they can print out the record of I-94 they can go apply for a job I recommend getting the social security number be because most employers will want it from the employee in order to start a like they, they want to pay you to your bank account. Do you have a bank account? No. You need to open it. You need a social security number for that. So the path basically is you enter the country, you take your printout for the I-94, take your passport, go to the social security office, get yourself a number, then basically find a job and start working. But the status allows anyone to work, including kids. Even a minor who entered in this status gets the right to work. And if they want to mow someone's lawn for a dollar, they totally can. So I'll, um, I'll, just because you mentioned minors, I, I want to ask that question as well, uh, as as we did with Vipke mm -hmm. and with Marina. Um, can minors come to the United States on you for you without a parent or a guardian? Again, we're not Europe. So unfortunately, the answer is emphatically not. Minors cannot travel alone. Moreover, minors traveling with the permission of a guardian or any kind of like notarized statement, don't do this because they will end up in social services. Here in the United States, we're mortally afraid of child trafficking for bad purposes. So a child can travel with the, with the parent, not even granny, or legal guardian. God forbid we had cases like that. Parents have been killed. The child now lives with the granny. If she is the legal guardian, that's if she's not, ain't gonna happen. Um, kids between 18 and 21, from what I heard last, could, tra could uh, travel with someone provided they have their parents' consent. Uh, I recommend against, so kids under 18, not, not a chance. Don't do not do this to your kids because they will end up in social services. Kids over 18, yes, if there's a, a permission from the parent for a child to travel, and especially if they're going to be met by a relative here. So, for instance, my aunt is over there in the airport, and be prepared for them to actually ping the aunt and say, who are you meeting? What is your name? So a child between 18 and 21 who is traveling to be met here by relatives needs to know what are, what is the name of their relatives, what is their address, where they're going. That child might be subject to questioning in the secondary here. They're not going to do anything bad to them, but be prepared for that. It's definitely like in the top five most common scenarios that we have seen at Lino is people contacting us, um, especially if the parents need to stay in Ukraine because they are... Um, they, you know, a, a man who cannot leave, who is a single father trying to send their children here, and it just has created a ton of problems. So thank you for addressing that. So um, another probably difference between the U.S. and Europe, can people who come here on you for you, can they travel on whether it's back to uh, Ukraine or, you know, even travel for for pleasure, you know, such as to Mexico or Dominican Republic? Yes, very good question. Not outright. They can work immediately, but in order to travel, what you need to do is apply for a special permission to travel called advanced parole. Fill out online or in paper a form called I-131. It's not too long. It's a bit strange because it is designed for all kinds of travel. So just read the instructions to do it properly. 
apply for this. Once you get the advanced parole, it's basically like a sheet of paper, A4, with your photo saying such person can travel wherever. That uh, paper allows, it's basically an invisible cloak that allows you to get past the border guard and back. That is also true for people on TPS who are previously here illegally, which is another kind of form, so we're not touching. But advanced parole is a thing that allows to cross the border and come back. Important thing to notice is the dates on it. Cannot travel past the expiration date, need to get a new one. Make sure that once you come back, check the advanced parole before you buy your tickets. Um, and how does, uh, and I know this is a huge topic in itself that we covered actually in our webinar yesterday, but TPS, the temporary protected status that we have in the mm -hmm. United States, how does that interplay with you for you at this point? So initially they went in parallel because what happened was people who were here already were allowed TPS, people who were coming in here were allowed you for you. Now they're on the same train, they keep going. And so the person who entered on you for you who has their you for you expiring in 2024 will be eligible to apply for a TPS. So you for you is a temporary thing. It is basically, as I said in the beginning, TPS is for staying here, you for you is for getting here. So the people who are currently on you for you are allowed to fill out the same application for TPS, provided they were in the United States prior to August 23rd, 2024, right before the Independence Day. Yep. If you hear your TPS eligible, people on TPS, one thing to remember, work permits. People who are here on u for u can work incident to status. People who are here on TPS need a work permit. In all likelihood, most people who came on you for you have their status end in 2024, right? So if you are applying on the TPS in order to hop to the next train and keep going, make sure that you simultaneously apply for a work card. It's not cheap. It's $410, I believe, for the application. Sorry, but yes, you will need it. And the work cards take a long time to arrive. They take six to seven months if you're lucky. So whoever has their status expire in 2024 and is applying for the TPS in the foreseeable future, make sure that you get a work card as well, because otherwise the status will run. The uh, the takeaway that I got out of our webinar uh, yesterday, which is already posted about the extension of TPS, is that TPS generally can't hurt you, right? So if you if you got to add it, it's not a bad thing to have. Um, but which sure. status would you say is better for those people who are, you know, considering, um, I know it's kind of a difficult question because they're very different beasts, but, uh, which do you think is better TPS or you for you? Uh, that's, that's actually a fair question in a sense that you for you is likely going to also be extended, but you for you is only a problem that lets you in once your personal you for you runs out. The way to stay and continue working in the United States and traveling if you need to travel is to get a TPS. So TPS is the logical next step. Basically, uh, TPS was a train that was following on its own, and then for you was another that came next to it. And if you need to get into that train, do so. And then you can just keep going. Um, I don't know what will happen, I will be honest with you, to the U4U -U program. Will they extend it or not? Likely they will. But TPS is the status that allows people to stay in the United States. If they want to leave, eventually they can leave. If they want to stay here, they can stay. But unless they are traveling just back and forth using the advanced parole and staying here, if they decide to just, the United States didn't work. Germany is better. They went to Germany, they stayed there. What do they do to return? Once the advanced parole expires, they will need a U for U provided it still exists, or they would need to get a visa, and getting a visa may or may not allow them to hop onto TPS. So check your particular situation. Everyone's case is different. There is no cookie cutter thing that I can tell everyone, like this is gonna work for everyone. Check your case. And Talk just to, to just to um kind of clarify this this particular this particular part. So uh, what's so for the people who want to stay in the United States, right? Uh, what status would be better for them? 
Would it be TPS or U for you? And what are the different ways, so to speak, that they could legalize with either one of those? Mm -hmm. So um, with U for you, eventually you're looking to change status to either TPS or something else. With TPS, while staying on TPS, you can apply for something else as well. I'll be honest with you, I hate the word legalize because you are legal. So uh, whoever is on TPS is fully legal in the United States. Nobody gets to call them aliens or any other nasty words. They are fully legal participants of the US society. Having said that, some people don't feel quite comfortable just staying it like that because TPS allows you to stay, but if they, it's probably amounts to the same question that both Marina and Vipke were asked before. What if people like it here? Like, how do they, how can they stay? I get a lot of questions that sound like, is, does it make sense to change my TPS to a student visa or a work visa or something like that? The answer is no, it doesn't. Because you only need a visa if the visa does something TPS cannot. And TPS, or you for you for that matter, allow you to stay in the United States, work in the United States for any employer, and travel if you wish to travel, provided you get an advance parole. No employment visa, no student visa can do any better than that. Because employment visa sometimes is tied to a particular employer. Student visa doesn't allow you to work, so why bother? However, many people would like to stay in the United States and they would want a green card. Again, unlike Poland and Germany, you cannot just stay and uh, because you stayed here long enough or something. Green card needs a reason. The reasons for green card could be, again, think same logic. There is a U.S. sponsor. A person can get a green card if they are married to a U.S. citizen or a green card holder. Or maybe a visa holder who is applying for the green card and getting it and getting it for their spouse as well. They can get a green card through their employer, provided the employer can do a green card um, that they prove, for instance, that they tried and cannot hire an employee who is a U.S. citizen or green card holder, and this foreigner can do whatever they need. It's called firm-based green cards. Um, green card can be obtained if a person is an outstanding performer of any kind, outstanding artist, businessman, uh, scientist, these people can apply for themselves, provided they can prove that they are outstanding, and there are certain criteria for that. They can get a green card even without an employer, but by just showing that what they do is really cool. Um, another option is getting through winning the DV lottery. We have a lottery that starts in October and, and basically you have 10 days to apply and the lottery itself happens on May every year. Whoever played and won, if they are here on TPS, they can apply for adjustment of status. Just say, I just want the lottery, give me my green card. These people get green cards for themselves and their family, which is spouse and child under 21. Important notification, same-sex marriages are allowed in the United States, so spouse can be of any gender. Another important notice, a child, even under 21, if they got married themselves, they stop being part of the family. They're becoming independent, and you cannot include them under the Green Card application. You're old enough to get married, you're old enough to become independent. Okay, I see. Exactly, you're on your own. You're not part of the family anymore, correct? <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess a, a question about, um, about how you would go about doing this. How does one actually change the status? The application can be done if you are married to a U.S. citizen or a green card holder, then that person applies for you. Filling out a set of forms. Uh, some of it is on the USCIS.gov that tells you, you can get an attorney, you can um, just stay away from people who are not lawyers but trying to help unless it's a respected charity they can do really weird things um, if a person is applying for the, applying through the employer then the employer takes care of it the employer will tell you what they will need from you they will fill out all the paperwork basically they will uh, have to prove that they need you for whatever reason and they will get a green card for you so again the Ukrainian traveler is basically a beneficiary in this case 
a beneficiary of a marriage application, a beneficiary of an employment application. The only two applications that allow you to apply for yourself is winning a green card lottery, then you're on your own, or being outstanding, in which case you're also, you can say, I just apply for myself, nobody's helping me, but I'm cool enough that I will find work. Which, by the way, is one of the criteria when you're proving the uh, outstanding uh, alien so-called application, you need to show that either you already have a job in the United States or it will be available to you. So that's kind of the, the sponsor is still hovering somewhere in the background. Um, so thank you so much for giving us a good overview of the U.S. system. Um, I would just ask you if you're comfortable just to talk very briefly about the program in Canada. Um, just a few words. And then we have a few questions. Um, if anyone else has some questions that they would like to add, please do so. Uh, we'll take about 15 minutes for questions for all of our panelists. Well, the Canadian program, and I must warn everyone, I'm not a Canadian attorney. I just happen to know some things about it. The most important thing to know it, about it is that it ended. The last day to apply for the Canadian program was July 15th, 2023, which was when that was the last chance to apply for a visitor's visa under Koyev. It's done. Uh, the program extends until March 31st, 2024, which is the last day when Canada provides people with uh, like the last day to cross the border and still get into Canada. Uh, if people travel after that, they would need a standard Canadian visa. So that this is the last day to waiving the QIAT approved applications to cross the border. Um, and last day to change or extend or whatever, do something to a temporary resident status in Canada under this program. Uh, the fee will still be waived from what I understand up until March 31st, 2024. And March 31st, 2025 is the last, 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 last date when Ukrainians and their family members who are in Canada on this program can benefit from the settlement services. So in other words, if people are looking to uh, go to Canada, it's not that they can't do it. It's just that there is nothing special in place for Ukrainians to do it. So it would still have to be the same old ways of getting married or getting a job or whatever it may be for anyone in the mm -hmm. great white world. I think the only Canadian thing that needs to be or merits mentioning on this call is if you have an approved application, make sure you travel before March 31st. Because if you don't, it's going to just expire. And once you did, understand that you have only a year to enjoy the, whatever social services and protections they offer. Because after that, it's going to also go poof. So that having said that, Canada has open immigration system, which very few countries in the world do. So there is a way to basically get Canadian permanent residency by proving that you, within the points system listed on the Canada.gov website, you earned enough and they should consider you as a valuable person and let you live in their lovely country. That is still an option, but that is an option for everyone. Thank you so much, Rina. I'm going to give you a little bit of a break because we do have a few questions for sure. uh, for the US, um, but I'll go to the question uh, for Poland first. Um, so the question is... Um, a question from Olha. Um, Short-term return to Ukraine. What should you do not to lose a TP status? Uh, well, first thing you don't, you cannot cross thirty days because after thirty days you lose the status. It can be renewed, but uh, you also lose all the social benefits. And the problem is that you also can get those back, but it takes time. Unfortunately, the current system is so that when you cross the border, even if you do not stay there for over 30 days, when you cross the border, the system notifies the kind of social security fund that you cross the border and they automatically stop the benefits. Well, not every time, but like around... 60-70% of the time. So then, uh, when you come back, you're surprised with a letter, usually, that the benefits have stopped because you 
went out of the country for more than 30 days. And then you have to convince them that you did not go out for more than 30 days. Uh, so what is usually done, you write to the border guard and they check their system and then you go with this letter uh, to the social security uh, fund so to ZUS. But what can also be helpful because the border guard doesn't often um, write back quickly or they write back quite enigmatically because they have a standard form that they reply to everyone. Uh, so what is helpful, if uh, you keep the tickets, if you go by train or uh, if you go by bus, so that, um, because now you cannot most often get the stamp at the border in your passport. So it's important to have evidence of when you left and when you came back. So you can also attach this evidence to the board when you write to the border guard, and you can also provide it directly to ZUS, to the Social Security Fund. Um, and this will go a long way to convince them. But prepare that this will take most probably several months and you will get the payment after also for those missing months, in, but like in one payment. But this will be a problem for those months that they process your application and all these programs. And this is happening a lot in Poland. So uh, gather all the evidence that you can so that it goes more smoothly. Thank you so much, um, Marina. Uh, and a question for VK that's a pretty particular question. So uh, just feel free, you know, to say whether you, you know how to answer this one. Um, can you change a temporary residence based on paragraph 24 to a temporary residence based on a different paragraph? I don't know what these paragraphs are referring to. If you do, let us know. Um, so, but if you don't, neither does anyone else here. <laughs> well, well, the... Uh, section 24 uh, residence is the protection that we've just discussed and uh, there may be other types. Um, you can also, technically you can apply for asylum. Um, then you're an asylum seeker and you are not in the preferential social security system that you are when you are under the section 24 regime. Uh, as a Ukrainian refugee. So technically you can change to, for instance, that and apply for asylum. Then you're sort of legally in a similar situation like say a refugee from Syria. Um, I tend to say that this is uh, not preferential because um, you have no access to the job market. You're basically forced to wait until everything is fully approved until you have a status in Germany. And that may take a while because that is sort of done on the who's first in line basis. And if you change, you're last in line. Uh, and um, so this is technically, this is possible, uh, but I, I see no advantage in doing so. Thank you so much. So, of, of course, uh, I should have known that you would know what these paragraphs mean. So thank you <laughs> so much for clarifying that. So this is a question for um, everyone. And before we jump into the U.S. questions. Um, so the question was, it's a question from Sergei. Um, and we can start with Poland, uh, then move on to Germany, as we have, and end with U.S., uh, do I have to pay taxes from my income from remote job in Ukraine? And what is its amount? And how does accommodation providing depends on whether you have a job? So if I understand you correctly, Sergey, the, the, you have a remote job that is in Ukraine, but you're wondering whether you would have to pay taxes in um, Poland, Germany, or the United States if you live there uh, physically. So we'll start with Marina. Uh, okay, so it's a question of uh, two things. First, your tax residency, because your tax residency is calculated based on where you spend uh, um, 180 plus one days. Uh, so bigger half of the year. And if you're a tax resident uh, in Poland, you have the obligation to pay taxes in Poland from your income. But Ukraine and Poland have uh, a treaty on uh, avoidance of um, double taxation. 
So um, it depends on what is the work, whether it on and on which contract it is done, whether it is contract of employment or whether it's B two B. Uh, or any other possible titles of employment that exist uh, uh, in Ukraine. But normally, I would say that income received uh, in Ukraine for services performed in Ukraine is also a, an issue of where the services and the real work is actually performed, should be taxed uh, in Ukraine only. But it's definitely a case-by-case -case basis because it depends on the status of the uh, employee contract or non-employee contract if it's B2B and it's not employment and of the what type of the services uh, or the job it is. So whether you can state where the job is actually done. But uh, if you live in Poland for better half of the year, then you're a tax resident in Poland. So you may have some tax obligations uh, in Poland. And as for that, the housing and accommodation uh, refer to a job? No, in Poland, there is no such uh, connection. Thank you very much, Marina. So same question for you, uh, Vibke. What Marina said just sounds very, very logical. It could be the same in Germany, but I'm not a tax lawyer. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have, do not have the answer on this. I can only congratulate it because this is tax is sort of the finest worry I've heard in all the Ukrainian legal issues that came up. So this is, uh, you know, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Irina, uh, I know this question comes up a lot in the US at this point. So uh, if you can shed some light, that'd be helpful. Um, much as I'd love to, I'm also not a tax lawyer and here taxation is extremely and insanely complicated. So there's a good reason I'm not. Um, to my understanding, there first there is a treaty. Also, second, taxes pertain mostly to people who have stayed over 183 days in the U.S. physically, and then they become residents. However, if you are in the United States, I would urge you not to try and do the taxes yourself through TurboTax or some other available form. Uh, at least the first time, visit the CPA get some assistance for your taxes because you might lose money because there is some loophole that you are eligible for and you didn't know. I'm not gonna answer the question about like whether the income that comes from Ukraine will be taxed because um, I don't think I'm allowed to do so, I'm not an ex-lawyer. So what I will do is I will actually put in a link in for everyone. Uh, I, I constantly feel like uh, you know my answer is, well, we had a webinar for that. And mm -hmm. so we did have a webinar on the U.S. income tax code uh, with a CPA. So um, folks are welcome to review that. Um, and that should answer, uh, if I remember correctly, having watched it, I, that should answer your questions uh, pretty well. Okay, so now we're moving on to a few questions for um, Arena. If anyone else has questions for any one of the panelists, please type them in. We're going to go for just a few more minutes. Um, so this question should be probably, hopefully easy. Uh, is it possible to enter the USA so that I can return to Ukraine and fly to the States again? That is where your advanced parole comes in. So again, depending on the status, if you are a holder of a tourist visa, you can totally travel the way you please. If you are coming on the U for you, it is intended for a single entry. And then they expect you to actually get the advanced parole, which can take from six to nine months. So plan accordingly. Coming here for a short visit and then leaving and then coming back again and stay is not an easy thing to accomplish. I've had people do this when they need to bring the kids in. And then they go back and then they finalize whatever they need to finalize and try to come finally. Many of them actually apply for a visa for that purpose. They get the visa, they travel on a visa, come back, and then they travel on the U for you. I wouldn't necessarily urge you to do that. Every case is different. But do not count on coming here on a U for you and being able to travel back within like three weeks. This is not going to happen. Okay. Let's so sim it. Similar question in a sense that we're talking about um, time limitations, so to speak, um, uh, from Kostya, uh, what is the way to speed up getting a work permit in the U.S. on TPS? Is there a way? 
Oh, there is no way that works every time. The only people who successfully were able to do this were employers who are trying to petition for their employees saying, if that person loses their right to work, something bad is going to happen to the company. That is mostly the privilege of, that happened a lot for hospitals during COVID, saying we can't lose this nurse. Nowadays, it's harder. Uh, you need to have a compelling evidence by the standard of necessity to speed up in order for your application for urgent or permit to be approved. Most evidence are not considered compelling. So if the company is saying, oh, this important employee, uh, if he doesn't stay employed, we're going to lose a huge contract or something like that. Most of the times they don't consider this. Um, the, the only like teeny part of the good news is that employment, per, like work permits sped up recently. It used to be like they listed 11 months. Now they're saying it's from three to five, which is kind of close to truth. Um, Costa no, reliable, no reliable way, unfortunately. So Costa has a, thank you. He has a, a follow-up questions also about TPS. So uh, could you, uh, what is the status of the applicant for TPS in the US during the period between applying and receiving the TPS status? I, I My understanding yeah. is that he's asking about how long it takes to receive oh. TPS. Very valid question. And the answer to that is if you applied for a TPS, uh, you are in TPS status until your next application is approved. If your application for the second TPS or extension for whatever reason is not approved and it is lost, then they might tell you things like uh, you need to leave the country. But in all likelihood, it is very hard to not get it approved. There will be like a valid reason for that. And most people know what the reason is. So I don't think it's your case. You are in TPS status. Same, by the way, is true of your work card. If you had one, you are extending your TPS and you filed for a new work permit. What will happen is by virtue of filing for a new work permit, while you have the old one, the old permit is extended for 180 days. If you need to show to someone that you have a right to work in the United States, you bring the card and you bring the extension um, notice that says we have received your application. Those two documents extend your current work permit by 180 days. It used to be 540, but that rule ends in October. It's 180 days from the day of the extension. Within that time, hopefully you will get a new one. But you have a right to work. Your right to work has not stopped if you filed again. So just to clarify, and this is part of course this question, am I legal? You know, and I'm sure another term that you don't really love, but <laughs> am I legal in the US while waiting for confirmation of TPS when my visa already expired? You're absolutely legal in the US while you await your confirmation. Visa expiration date doesn't matter anymore now that you're here. Think of a visa expiration date as of a little date on the cinema tickets, which says you can enter the cinema up until 10 o'clock. If you entered at 7, that's fine. You can't enter at 10.40, but you can still enter between anything and 10. Once you're there, it doesn't matter anymore. Understood. And uh, just to follow up on that, uh, what status would Costa have in case the U.S. government refuses the TPS status for him? Um, the denial notice will say something to the effect of we're denying your TPS application and they will tell you what they think. Most likely they will say you have 30 days to leave the country. After that, you become illegal. Everyone is in the status for which they requested extension until the government says to the contrary. You apply for a TPS, you are TPS, and once you get a new TPS, you continue being TPS. If you don't, if you don't get it, then they will tell you what they consider the date of the of the loss of status. And um, an important point to know is that a day or two or two weeks or something of overstay is not a problem. Six months and more is. So if the application for TPS is pending for four months and everybody already got theirs and it's not like everyone's suspending what your particular is, see someone. 
you want to make sure that you're on the right side of the things. Because one terrible thing is a wrongfully filed application that did not return immediately. That wasn't immediately sent back. And then that arrives like in a year and a half saying, oh, you failed to add this. Now, bad things happen. So two tips. Make sure your application has been filled out correctly. Follow the instructions, read the rules. Once it is in, if you receive the receipt notice, you are in status that you had before you are in TPS, you're fine. Up until we say something else to you, hopefully never. Hopefully never. Um, and we have two more questions. The questions are for uh, from Amina and Olga. Um, unless you you want to add something, I think that, you know, what I, I will read the questions, but I don't necessarily think that that's something that we really can answer um, unless you think otherwise, Irina. So a uh, question from Amina was, in which state will it be easier for Ukrainians to live? That depends on what you're looking for. If you have an extensive family with multiple elderly family members uh, and you're looking to get as much social services as you can, there are states that are better than others. I would very cautiously say aim for big cities. Uh, yeah. Aim for It is New York and like all of California would probably be better than Kentucky or Nevada in terms of providing assistance, providing benefits. Having said that, if you're looking for an immediate job uh, or something like that, there, there, there's a lot of considerations. Uh, if you need to know what state can offer what kind of social services, I will send you back to Lini website, which has a pretty decent write-up on that. And I'm sure Luba will share this information better than I will. <laughs> So I will, um, I will also, uh, aside from the Lino website that um, you're absolutely welcome to peruse, which has some information on public benefits. Also, um, there is a wonderful organization called Svitlo, um, S-V-I-T-L-O-U-S. And I just threw that link in, in there and they really go state by state and you can type in and find resettlement agencies in uh, whatever state you're interested in and, and really find out what benefits are in which uh, state, because for some people, public benefits are really important. For others, housing is important. So it, it, just like Karina said, it depends. And similarly, a question from Olga, which will be our last question, um, is uh, was a question for the, for the, for the USA. Um, health insurance for Ukrainians who entered the USA under the U4U U program. Um, as far as I know, there there is there there is some federal assistance under you for you, uh, but it's more problem it's it's more complicated than that. Um, so I would I would say that you definitely are better off contacting a resettlement agency in the state that you are going to be potentially trying to move to. But I will leave that to Arena to answer more uh, more appropriately. That I, I quite agree with what Luba just said. It's a bit outside my ken because I mostly deal with immigration and not health insurance, but. Um, much depends on the state where you end up in, because states, we are a federation like Germany, but we are more of a confederation. States are extremely different. They're almost like little states of their own. That's the reason they call states. So there is some federal assistance. Every state can offer different amounts of money for whatever, or allocate different amounts of money for particular healthcare services. Uh, you may need to do particular research on particular states and choose your destination in accordance with what health insurance you need. Again, this is different for every family, like more senior family members who need particular services. Make sure you look into what exactly is allowed because the fact that something is covered can be devil in the details. See whether if you're interested in a particular uh, malady or a length of coverage or copy, different considerations may bring you ultimately to a different decision. I can't really advise like which which place is better. I'd say generally, very generally, aim for the shores. Other than that, you need to look up your state and see what they offer. And I uh, uh, also dropped into the chat for everyone. Um, we have a special page which has some charts on social benefits for Ukrainians, again, depending on the program that you're here on. So it goes through TPS, it goes through um, you for you. So hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, on that note, uh, thank you everyone who joined um, and to everyone who will be watching it later, I'm sure. And thank you most to um, our panelists, to Irina, to Marina, to Vivke. This is so 
different than what we have done before. Um, I believe our first English speaking webinar and uh, thank you so much for making it happen. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. Slava Ukraini, Giroim Slava. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. <laughs> everyone have a wonderful, everyone. wonderful night to those of you who have been here until eight o'clock um, and enjoy the rest of your day for those who are in the U.S. Thank you.